It came out in 2018. We didn't do an episode about it. We are going to rectify this by discussing the very fun and meta Teen Titans Go to the movies. Coming this summer. They're finally going to make a movie about me! The story of Batman's greatest ally. That's me! That must be me! And best friend in the whole world. Finally! Alfred, the movie. It's time to clean up this city. That actually does look pretty good. I can see it. Just a young gun with the quick view. They're really making movies about every superhero. Has there been a movie about you? There was a Green Lantern movie, but we don't we don't talk about that. It's time they make one about me. I'm afraid it's no. I only make movies about real superheroes. <laughs> Dream about being a big star. Why don't they take us seriously? Titans, you guys are never actually doing anything heroic. What about that time we discovered that sweet diner and they had that food? <laughs> that wasn't even a crime and you didn't save anything. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the pile of shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cuson. You can find me on Twitter at Jerome C. 1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at The Real World are doing included as part of this package is Kevin Ford and I recently did a review of the first season of Veronica Mars, Mars Investigated. Definitely go check that out. Also, go and check out Ben Phillips and Matt Waters as they are talking about their favorite 25 movies of the aughts including uh, they've reviewed such movies as Ocean's Eleven, Adaptation, and Lost in Translation. So definitely make sure you go check all that out. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you could do so in two ways. First, send an email to superheropantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at HeroPantheon. My co-host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, this is our final Batman Summer Adventure, I guess you could say, as we have reviewed every Batman movie up to this point. This is not a movie that really pertains to Batman necessarily, but there is a very specific reason that we chose it, because it focuses on his sidekick, his sidekick Robin, who has been a, a, a kind of the background of so many of these movies, but he hasn't gotten his own movie, and that's kind of what this movie is about. I mean, technically, is it really a Robin movie? I don't know. It's it's under the Teen Titans Go label, but yeah, I mean, when they announced this movie, I was just like, what the heck? Like, the, the show itself is like 15-minute episodes, I think, sometimes. Uh, it, it's just amazing that, like, they could take that concept and just stretch it out into a movie, and yeah, I was kind of worried about the plot, and going into this, I wasn't really excited about the plot anyway, I was just more like, I hear about these Easter eggs and all these, like, meta jokes that they make and how fun it is for adults, and I was like, did they get the right target audience? I don't know. But somehow they kind of merged the two together and they kind of came out with this. And it was kind of fun, but man, the plot is horrible. But there is a lot of Easter eggs that just made me laugh my ass off. Right. If you are coming to this movie for the plot, then you are coming to the wrong movie, quite frankly. And unfortunately, in the deluge of the summer, I'm sure the fact that this was 2D animation, which is something you really don't see anymore. This movie did not do very well at the box office, making just about $10 million. I feel like this is the kind of movie that once we get HBO Max and once we get Warner Brothers streaming service, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of content that you would probably see go right into that streaming service and not even get a theatrical release, which I kind of have mixed feelings about. But I remember watching this in theaters and really, really enjoying it. And for a number of different reasons, we really did not have a chance to do a bonus episode of it. That is one of the main reasons that I wanted to rectify this now and just talk about it because uh, the legacy score is probably not going to be very strong, but I do want to cover some of the Easter eggs. There are just a couple of notes here. 
uh, we get a parody of Marvel at the very beginning as we get a montage of flipping comic pages from the New Teen Titans, which is a comic book that came out in November of 1980. This appears at the beginning of the film. This is also a reference to Marvel Studios flipping comic pages logo in the comics. We get a villain who goes by the name of Slade, and there are many jokes that are made, and they say this name quite a bit. Slade's supervillain name is Deathstroke. This name has never been used in a Teen Titans cartoon, because it was decided that a character with death as part of his name should not be in a children's cartoon. However, he was referred to as Deathstroke in Lego DC Comics Superheroes The Flash, an animated movie marketed to children, which was released a few months before this movie. And they also do make specific reference to Deadpool and Deathstroke being a parody of Deadpool. So there's, uh, I guess you could say there's some mixed messaging going on here. Yeah, that was so confusing, but I guess it's just, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen and too many people taking different directions from different bosses, and thus you get this, you know, way over kind of oversight kind of thing going on because I just couldn't believe that why don't they say Deathstroke they keep saying Slade and not even Slade Wilson just Slade but it's also uh, it's cool because like one of my favorite bands is Slade and no one really knows that band so shout out to Slade it's like a 70s 80s kind of borderline glam rock band so this might be the only chance I can actually shout him out on the podcast so go Slade I do appreciate the fact that they kind of make his name part of the joke. I think that, at the very least, works. There are a lot of meta jokes in here, but one of the more obscure ones that I wanted to point out is, after discovering the Doomsday device, Robin scolds his team about how they're treating Superman, saying he's a national treasure. Nicolas Cage, who voices Superman, is well known for his popular movie, National Treasure. That is, uh, there are some real deep cuts. The fact that Nicolas Cage is voicing Superman is a deep cut because, as we discussed at the beginning of the year with our episode about Superman Lives, that Nicolas Cage was supposed to play Superman, he never got a chance to do so, and he got to play kind of a, basically a cameo in here, playing this role. Yeah, I was blown away because I didn't even know that going in. And then I was like, oh, my God, it's it's the most meta joke. And then it, that wasn't even the most meta joke in this movie, I think, because at one point you see Nicolas Cage's Superman standing there and he's standing in front of a poster at Warner Brothers Studios. And the poster is him as Superman with a mustache. So there you go. That That's the kind of jokes we're getting into, kids, because like for the first 15 minutes, I was not even paying attention. At the, or anything going on other than the background because there's just so many Easter eggs going on in the background. Up until Slade Wilson comes in, that's when I started paying attention to the plot again. But yeah, I was just blown away with like Superman and all that kind of thing. and Just the fact that Nicolas Cage was there as the voice, amazing. And then shout out to not just National Treasure, but National Treasure 2. I thought that was a, a good follow-up sequel. Not as entertaining as the first, but no one ever shouts that out. They always shout out the first one. Something I was also genuinely amused by watching it a second time around is when they show some of the trailers, and one of the trailers is for an Alfred movie, and wouldn't you know it, there is an Alfred television series that is basically the movie that they were parodying in this in, the, in Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Incredible. Yeah, I, I was laughing so hard at that, because... I guess a year, if you watched this when it first came out, like you, you originally did, that joke would have been nothing other than just, oh, it's an Alfred movie. No one's going to watch that. But the fact a year later, it gets even more meta with this, I think it's stars or whatever it is, but just hilarious because now it's got another layer to it. Not only that, but for the fake trailers, they use the Batman 89 font. And knowing me as a graphic designer, I recognize fonts. And that, as a graphic designer, I marked out for that, too. Big time. And it, it, in fact, does not air on Stars. It airs on Epics, which I am a firm believer that that, as a network, is only a rumor and does not exist. But apparently the show isn't that bad. I will probably never watch a minute of it, though. Yeah, that's what I heard, too, because I, I had a buddy who actually got uh, uh, one of the test screeners or whatever. Not the test screen. He went to a test screening for the pilot, and he said it was amazing. And that was, like, a year ago. So I've heard about this show coming out for a while, I think, so I still have no interest in it because, you know, f- for me now, being spoiled with the MCU, I want, you know, continuity and crossovers and everything like that, and I get that from the, the CW show, so that's enough for me. All right, let's talk about the heroes. Of course, we are talking about the Teen Titans. 
The Titans have had many different versions at this point. They had a Cartoon Network show where they were, I would say, older teenagers. The This is kind of their more tweens than teens. And, of course, there is also the Titans television show that is now airing on the DC Universe app. And it's probably most infamous because of something that Robin says in the trailer about Batman. Maybe at some point we can get into that, but... I think that one of the things about this movie is that it is so heavily focused on Robin, and the other teen, the other Titans do not feel as important. There is Beast Boy, there is Cyborg, poor Cyborg, put in the background again, just like in Justice League. I, I feel like he at least gets to be a part of the joke a little bit more here. Raven, who I think is a fascinating character that I wish had gotten a little bit more time, and Starfire. I think they're entertaining kind of as, as side characters, but they're not really given as much of a story. I And the other DC heroes, you get your Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Swamp Thing is in this. Those other DC characters are purposefully not focused on. I do want to point out that this is the first of, or the second of two movies that came out in the summer of 2018 to make fun of the Green Lantern movie. Yeah, and uh, not only that, it was the the, um, the the Black Green Lantern too. I forget his name, but like, just yeah, that was that was even more meta because I think that they should have made his version of Black Green Lantern instead of the Hal Jordan one. But but yeah, like the heroes, it's it's all about Robin in this and in the show. I've seen some episodes, like I've said, a lot, the, a lot of the show did cover a lot of the background of, of Raven and Starfire already, so I get that. And same thing with Cyborg and Beast Boy. So, and I guess the idea was to pitch it as, oh, we're gonna make a Robin movie through this, you know, name as the Teen Titans go and make it more centric around Robin. So I guess that was kind of the pitch to the studio. But, yeah, it kind of worked out, I guess, because he's the most known, you know, worldwide in general. You know, he's the sidekick of Batman. Everyone knows him. So uh, I bet people going into this casually had no idea who Raven was or Starfire, you know what I mean? Unless they're watching that DC app show. But I didn't watch that. I watched Doom, uh, Doom Patrol instead. But, um, yeah, I think they did okay. It's just, you know, they made Robin look like such a selfish prick, though, but he's like that in the show, so I'm used to it, but even more so in this movie, so it kind of hinders the score for me, because it made Robin even more unlikable, and I want to think that this is Jason Todd, but I think it actually is Dick Grayson, so that that sucks even more, because I'd expect that from Jason Todd, not Dick Grayson. So, for those who don't know, this is based off of the Cartoon Network series, Teen Titans Go, and the, the concept of this series is essentially that we are not seeing them actually do a lot of fighting. There's not really a lot of action, but it's kind of the things that take place between the missions. Is that a good way of describing it? Because I'll be honest, I watched a couple episodes of the series itself and I actually didn't really like it, but I actually do enjoy the movie. So is that kind of an accurate read on the show? I would say that in like 30% action where it's like they got to face either a bad guy every now and then or a giant... It's usually something of like a Dexter's Laboratory type of... Or Powerpuff Girls kind of like finale, if that makes any sense, for like the last three minutes. And we kind of get a, a sense of that toward the the beginning of this, uh, when they take on uh, the giant thing. Um, so I had a really hard time coming up with the score for this because, again, I don't think that the other four Titans are lack in entertainment value, but I wish that we had gotten a little bit more character from them because, again, so much of the focus is on Robin. I think the, the whole purpose of this movie is that Robin is a little salty, and I can understand why, because the, the idea in, in this universe is that everybody is getting their own superhero movie. And again, this is a very meta-commentary, but Robin is not able to because he is a quote-unquote sidekick, and he is basically stuck not getting his own movie or being relegated to kind of a supporting player. And unfortunately, what this leads him to do is he becomes so obsessed with this idea of getting his own superhero movie that he snaps and abandons the other Titans at one point and falls into Slade's trap, so to speak, and eventually has to grow and realize that without the Titans, he really isn't the kind of person that he should be. And I think this is a really interesting concept given the way that we've seen Robin portrayed in some of the Batman movies, because in those movies, so much of it is about having a mentor. And in this case, it's about him taking on these, these folks as peers, kind of a, a found friendship, if you will, a different kind of found friendship that Batman than Batman, because in, in Batman's case, it's about being the son to a father, but in this case, it's kind of being the leader of a peer group. 
Yeah, it's got this, like, Goonies kind of feel, you know what I mean? Like, the, you know, the groups together, the Stranger Things, the It's, you know what I mean? Like, I like that concept, so I like their chemistry together, so that really works. Um, and then, but it's just, I don't know, Robin just being this dick, but, like, I mean, I guess that's the point of the movie, right? It's for him to have that, that, you know, character arc and then have that redemption at the end, getting his friends back, right? But, um, you know, I think it's just, it's too complex as a, you know, as, like, a character plot, or like a, you know, for, you know what I mean, like a character journey for this kind of movie, you know, I think like kids are not going to see that message. I don't know, I'm not sure, but it just feels like that's more of like an adult themed Robin movie, that kind of concept. And not only that, it's just kind of like a, a kind of commentary on Hollywood and actors too. You know what I mean? Like that whole idea of going to Warner Brothers Studios that just felt like I felt like I was watching Bowfinger or something like that. You know what I mean? Like a commentary on Hollywood itself. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I just feel like that the plot that they used for Robin is just I don't know, the the age group is a little too low to understand it, I think, because I think they're aiming for, like, 5 to 12, I think that works for, like, 17 to, like, you know, 30 kind of age group, but that's just me. Right, and so much, so much of what makes this fascinating is that this is meant to be a kid's movie, but just like with Lego Batman, there is so much meta-commentary, I could probably even make the argument that this has even more of a meta aspect to it than the the Lego Batman movie because here they're not only referencing Batman but there's the Green Lantern joke there's the National Treasure reference there's the reference to Batman Begins Slade's plot is basically a ripoff of Batman Forever and there's other stuff too there's the fact that Stan Lee has a cameo we'll get to that uh, a little bit later but there's so many meta aspects I mean they, they make an Animaniacs joke I mean are, do 5 and 12 year olds even understand who they are at this point in 2019? I mean, maybe they do. Maybe I am naive in the ways of thinking this, but it's it's really interesting. So the score that I came up with was a 7 because I still really think that everybody's entertaining. I actually did like the musical numbers that they were involved in, and I, I kind of love the mechanics of Cyborg's uniform and the way that he is able to use it. I love Raven. Raven, as a character, might actually get me to watch that Titan show on the DC Universe, at least the first few, first few episodes, just to see how she is portrayed, because I think it might just work out better on a show like that. But that's kind of where I came down. I'm giving Teen Titans a 7 for the hero score. I'm going to go with a 6, just because my problems with Robin are just... He's so, he's so annoying in this movie, man. He's such a whiner and complaining. I mean, yeah, he's like that in the show, believe me, but it, it got even worse here, and... But that's his character redemption, so I get it. But it's still, it was too much for me, six. All right, let's talk about the villains. In this case, there is really only one major villain, and that is Slade slash Deathstroke. I would argue that he is slightly better than the average Marvel villain. I, I appreciate the fact that we get some great voice work out of Kristen Bell and Will Arnett. Kristen Bell is, uh, is playing Jade Wilson, who is a female director, which I don't know what kind of commentary that they're making that it is a female director that is directing all of these movies and is behind all of this and that, in fact, it is a male. I don't know what they were trying to say with that, but I did appreciate the voice work. I think Slade is kind of the perfect cartoon villain in that he is kind of a threat. He is a menace. I think there are aspects of his plan that are actually pretty brilliant. I especially did like the part where Robin is doing the final scene of his movie, he gets knocked out, and then Slade brings him to their real hideout so that he can get what he needs for his doomsday device. I think his motivations are obvious, and again, he is basically pulling out the plot of Batman Forever, but I actually think in a way it's it's a little bit better done. Yeah, I, I like this a lot, because at first I thought they were going for like, oh my god, are they going to make Slade Wilson a woman, and it's going to be Jade Wilson, you know what I mean? But, uh, no, they just made it Slade Wilson dressed as a woman with with Kristen Bell as the voice. So I thought that was we- kind of funny. I thought they were going to go for, like, I, I don't know, maybe make her make her trans, make it like this, you know, trans character and make it revolutionary. But, I, you know, they didn't do that either. It was just kind of confusing at first. But then once you realize that Slade Wilson actually puts the mask on of <laughs> Jade Wilson over his metal mask or whatever, or whatever kind of mask it was, that that was the true part. So, it, yeah, it was it was pretty funny. And then once you realize that, you know, because you kind of figure it out, like, you know, right at the beginning, and then once you see the mannerisms and the way they're talking, it's like it's Will Arnett acting as Kristen Bell, and sometimes it's Kristen Bell acting as Will Arnett. So I thought that was kind of funny how they did that. Um, but at the end, it's, you know, it's 
it's, you know, he's a comedy character when he's, like, Slade, you know what I mean? It, it reminds me of, like, a Lucha character, the way they did him, but that's just the way Slade is designed, or Deathstroke is designed, right? He's got the mask and the, and the orange and the dark black or whatever, dark blue sometimes. So, it you know, that's just me being a wrestling fan, I guess, but it just felt like a Lucha Libre kind of portrayal in his, like, act. I don't know. That was just me, me being me, I guess, but um, I'm going to give him a six because... I wasn't totally blown away. I love the concept that was uh, him playing a female director. And the commentary on that, I think, from what I was kind of reading up on and, like, you know, bullshit conspiracy theories as to why that joke was even in there, or, or is it even a joke? It's like, you know, she was at that time when this movie came out probably the most successful director in the DCEU, wouldn't you say that? Yeah, I would say that is definitely the case, and it's only gotten to be even more so because Anna Eva DuVernay is going to be doing th- uh, a movie in the DCU as well. So that's what I'm saying. I think they were saying like she, like they're showing that the female director of all the directors was the best director so far. That's why she's in it. And it's not a Zack Snyder version of the character in the, you know what I mean? I think they were showing like, and saying that like, Hey, she's the best director you got. And you probably should subconsciously kind of go with her. Perhaps. I think that's, that is a good way of putting it. I'm also going to give this a six. I really do like aspects of the character, but I think when you're doing a, a movie like this, the, the villain score can only go so high because it is a cartoon. And you really can't do a lot of pathos, especially when the movie is barely an hour and 20 minutes. Let's, let's talk about the story. Again, the plot of this movie is, is not great. It's very meta. Robin is sad about not getting his own movie while everybody else is getting one. We talked about Alfred already. We got some time travel being used. We have to talk about the time travel part because they purchased the rights to the Back to the Future score and they used a part of it. And there's a point when Cyborg comes comes in and there's a song that's about to play. And in my mind, I'm like, if they, if they play Back in Time by Huey Lewis, I'm going to lose my shit. They did not, but then, like, two minutes later, they did, in fact, use Back in Time by Huey Lewis as they are doing the montage of different superheroes and their origin stories and basically trying to make them not be superheroes. And we get something with Wonder Woman, we get Aquaman, we get Batman's parents not being murdered, we get the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being sent away from the mutagen... And then, Brian, they, they have to bring it all back because they realize that a, a world with no superheroes simply is not going to work. The Batman part is really dark. Whew, yeah, so in regards to this whole time travel thing, that should have been the plot of the freaking movie because this was the most, by far, the most interesting part. And yeah, the same thing. I was like, they're not going to play back in time. But then I kept thinking, like, in that 30-second time frame, like, wait a minute, they just bought the rights to the actual music. I think Huey Lewis might actually be cheaper to get. And then they played it. So, you know, I was like, oh, my God. But that for this five, I don't know, I think it was just only five minutes, but, like, the idea was we're going to go back in time, get rid of all the primary superheroes. That way Robin is a primary superhero and he gets his own movie. So they do, you know, all these shady things. They, they point... Uh, uh, the Wayne family away from Crime Alley and towards the Happy Alley or whatever it was or Candy Alley. I don't know. It was it was very nice and peaceful. So when they go back, there's no Batman, there's no Superman, there's no Aquaman. In fact, when they I think they killed Aquaman for a good two minutes in this movie because the way they get rid of Aquaman, they just threw a freaking six pack container uh, plastic thing and then the thing got around his neck like a fish, like in that commercials or many commercials. But but yeah, and then. They figured, oh, wait a minute, we need the actual superheroes back because the world's in chaos now. So they go back and fix everything and basically undo everything. Um, and then when they when they have to go back and the fi- fix the Batman origin story, they they just throw his parents in the crime alley, and then you see three gunshots go off in the night. And there you go. So that was pretty goddamn dark. But, I mean, I laughed, but maybe for the wrong reasons, the right reasons, I'm not sure. But I, I don't know what a kid would think, man. I don't know either. I think what you well basically this is Slade is basically Riddler from Batman Forever, which is a movie that introduced Robin. This cannot be a coincidence. And I think what the story of this movie also is it is a commentary on our obsession with superhero movies and perhaps not embracing the fun moments and maybe enjoying something simple and fun like this movie and the show, enjoying those moments in between. But what I think is genuinely amazing about this is that now we have a DC Universe app. We're going to have the Disney Plus app with all of those MCU shows. So this movie is absolutely correct, correct and predictive of the future. 
Right, because Slade's plan was to stream all the, uh, or basically uh, create a streaming service. They didn't really say that, but stream to every phone, TV, microwave, whatever that can stream, and then stream like any movie from Warner Brothers or whatever, or the superhero movies that he's been shooting with the superheroes. And the first big movie that's going to premiere on the launch date, kind of like The Mandalorian, is going to be the Robin movie. And that's the whole, you know, backstory of them creating the app and the launch and all that kind of thing. Which is ironic because Titans was the show that premiered on day one of the DC Universe app. And who is the star of Titans? Robin. Amazing how that works. I, I don't know, man. I don't know if that was on purpose. Subcon- I don't know. Because there's a lot of people that don't communicate within the world of Warner Brothers, obviously. And shit doesn't line up. But this this perfectly lined up in some weird meta way, especially watching it a year after. And I think that watching this actually a year later from the release date made it more even enjoyable, I want to say, just because of these kind of things that happened. There are some scary connections in here, so for all of those reasons, I'm going to probably give this a slightly higher score than I would have last year. If if this was last year, I probably would have said a 4 or 5, but the fact that it's so good at predicting the future, and for some great moments and great scenes, I'm going to give this a 6. See, I'm going to go lower, because... For me, I thought it was just too choppy. Like, the, the, the time travel stuff was just five five random minutes of the movie. So I'm giving this a four because, God, for the first 15 minutes, like I said, I didn't care what the hell was going on because there's just so much stuff in the background. And then once Slade comes in, it gets interesting. And then they do the time travel stuff. And I'm like, oh, great, the movie's starting is like the actual plot of the movie. And then they take it away from you after five minutes. And that was like the best part of the movie. And then I'm like, shit. That was the best part, I think, and now it's just going to go downhill from here, and it kind of goes back and forth, and you get the Robin arc, but for me, it was just all over the place, and I wish it was more focused, but again, I feel like that's kind of the way they have to write these things, because it's a children's thing, and the attention span, and all that kind of thing, but I wish they would have stuck to the time travel stuff, so four it is. All right, it's unfortunate that they didn't do that, but let's talk about the technical aspects of this. You don't really got a lot, you don't really get a lot of 2D animation movies. I think it's unfortunate that Disney hasn't tried to do a 2D animation movie in quite some time. I'm hoping the Disney Plus service will convince them otherwise. This is gonna. This might be one of the last 2D movies, and I think it looks really great. It doesn't look great within the context of other animated movies, but I think for the style that it was going for and what it was trying to do, I think it worked out really well. Just some of the pacing, I think, was really good. Again, this movie's an hour and 20 minutes. I love the use of music, the score, use of the Back to the Future theme, Back in Time. It's a breezy runtime for all those reasons. I give this a 7. See, this is going to be weird because I just gave a 4 on the writing, but, man, I'm going to give this a 9. And I have my reasons because, like like you just said, the use of music in this movie is pretty fucking on point. And this is the part I've been waiting for. We had a Michael Bolton cameo. And not only that, he's a tiger, a singing tiger. And I've been listening to that song. It's an upbeat, inspirational song about life. And then it's like this two-minute music video of like an '80s thing, and they've got the they did '80s saxophone, and I was just I was just marking out. And and then all of a sudden they hit him in the middle of the road, man. Like I don't know who's driving, but all of a sudden you see Michael Bolton Tiger singing on the road, and then they hit him, and the music just stops. And I'm like, oh my god, they just killed the tiger dude played by Michael Bolton. And I was like, oh, this has to come up later in the movie because this is like, this is like I Know What You Did Last Summer or something like that. And there's got to be some reference to that and nothing from that. And that kind of attributes to the story score because they didn't follow up on that. But, I mean, goddamn, Michael Bolton and then 80 saxophone. Not only that, like, I love the use of colors in the Teen Titans Go universe. Like, in the show, I think it's just beautifully animated. Just the bright colors. And you always see this dark kind of tone with all these DC shows and you get a DC show like this and it's bright and beautiful and you get the original red and bright green, not bright green, but you know, like the red and green Robin costume instead of the dark, you know, Ruben, you know, Ruby, um, burgundy color red. I hate that when they do it with the Robin costume. So I'm giving it a nine. They did the colors right. The music was fantastic. And, uh, I mean, wh- yeah, it's 2d animation, but man, I mean, if you do it right, you know, put things in scale, you make giant robots, not not a giant robot, but a giant inflatable, whatever that was at the beginning of the movie, look huge. Like, you know, that you did a good job on the animation too. So there you go. All right, the legacy of this movie. This was very well reviewed. I actually went back and read some of the praise for this movie and it was mostly effusive just in how good it was. But it's also was kind of forgotten, not making very much money at the box office. 
the hope for this is that this will find a kind of a cult audience on streaming and through VOD once Warner Brothers streaming service starts. It is on HBO Now, HBO Go Now, so if you've not seen it, that is an easily accessible way of checking this this movie out. And while you're watching Succession on HBO, maybe go watch Teen Titans go to the movies as well because this is super fun. I had a very hard time coming up with a legacy score for this, but based on some of the meta aspects of things, it kind of bumped it up for me. The fact that it did such a good job of predicting what would happen in the future and the fact that this was spawned off of a relatively successful Cartoon Network TV show, I settled on a score of five. I'm going to go with a five as well for those reasons. And, you know, it's it's hard because, like, I don't know five years from now, ten years from now, if this is going to, you know, raise its stock on the whole cult movies kind of scale. Um, I don't know if it's going to be, like, you know, a Clerks kind of level or, like, a fucking, you know, Howard the Duck kind of level. You know what I mean? I, I would say Clerks is much higher on the cult movie scale if that's kind of how you want to rate things. So if, ten years from now, I don't know how that's going to work because this is a weird kind of audience I don't know if, like, a 25-year-old 10 years from now, meaning they'd be 15 now, would understand things going on in this kind of writing because the jokes are so, like, I mean, for a certain audience, you know, dated a little bit, you know what I mean? So um, it's hard. So I'm going to go with the 5 as well. All right, my total score is a 31, and yours is? Uh, 30. So it's, it's, I, I know I gave this movie a lot of shit for the plot, but it's just a lot of good elements, plus the really high score of the nine really helped the score up for me, but it deserved it on that regard. Like, it's visually amazing to watch. I'll give it that. I think this movie is a very solid 6 out of 10, and I think that this is the kind of movie where you are watching it for the Easter eggs, you are there to watch it for some of those smaller moments, and there's so many of those in a movie that is an hour and 20 minutes. And I think there are there are a couple of really good scenes, especially the one, the the Back to the Future sequence and the sequence with Slade and Robin. And plus, there's a lot of uh, mini commentaries throughout the movie about superhero films. I know that you noticed one about Batman Begins. Uh, which one was that again? I forgot. There's so many. It was the one where Robin was filming a sequence in the rain, I believe. I think they went like Batman Begins with it and just fucking did the origin story. I don't know, something like that. I. I, there's so many things I probably forgot already, but I mean, I just watched this short time ago, but there was just so many I probably forgot already. All right, let's get to the burning questions. Favorite voiceover? Uh, Will Arnett, just because in one year span, he went from being Batman himself to a Batman villain uh, and all in all of the theaters. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just the shows, but in a movie theater, he was Batman and a Batman villain. So credit to him, because I don't think anyone's going to pull that off again. You know, Brian, you said you you DM me that, and all I could think of was there there was a recent Batman Ninja Turtles movie that came out. The person who voiced Batman also voiced the Joker in that movie. Oh, interesting! But that that was not theatrical release, so I think it was not a theatrical release. So as far as theatrical releases go, you are probably correct. But I I will give the person I, his name is Troy Baker. It's crazy how much he sounded both like Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. Yeah, that was one of the crazy aspects of that movie when I watched it, just like the voice and, and how much it sounded like him when I watched the Ninja Turtles Batman movie. Which we will review at some point in our next podcasting life. We did not talk about the Stanley cameo, so we're going to do it here. Is this Stanley's best cameo? Top five. I, I want to say the Captain Marvel one, man, because that has a lot of layers to it, especially being a big Kevin Smith fan, so I have to kind of... Always lean towards that one with my heart, but uh, yeah, I was marking out so hard for that because I, I forgot about it because I read about it at, like when it first came out, and I was like, oh, that's that's kind of awesome, and then I totally forgot about it, and it happened, and I was like, oh, that's that's a great kind of cross. That's more, wow, I mean that kind of is a crossover within itself, right? Because in the MCU, he is the Watcher, right? Technically, that's what they've been labeling him, and the producers have just accepted that from the fans. So maybe he's watching the DC universe. I think it's genuinely amazing, his cameo, the fact that he talks about loving cameos, and first he's in the movie, and then he kind of goes away, and then he comes back. It's just outstanding, a great use of Stanley. I, I can't believe that we heard the word Excelsior in a DC movie. That is that is mind-blowing. May never happen again. Probably will never happen again. What is your favorite meta joke? Um... I guess when it's Superman standing in front of that poster of Superman with a mustache, because that, that says it all, man. I don't have to explain it. If you're listening to this podcast, you know the story. Uh, 
but yeah, that was that was truly meta because I'm staring at that. I'm like, the fuck is that a mustache on Superman? And Superman standing in front of the poster, crazy. And then a, a number two would be probably when they're driving by the uh, Mount Rushmore and they kind of altered Mount Rushmore to add superhero faces on them. And you see Abraham Lincoln with a Batman mask on. I'm like, that's awesome because that's a that's a viral image. That's been a shirt that's been printed for like years now on the internet. And I I guess Jerome had never heard of it. I showed him it, and he was blown away because that's a thing that's been on the internet for a while now. And that's like a that's one of those college kind of shirts. You know what I mean? A, you know Abraham Lincoln wearing the Batman mask. I that that was such a deep meta cut too. Definitely. And um, I mean, there's probably so many things we could watch this movie 10 times and probably pick out different things. My favorite meta joke is when they are driving in the Warner Brothers lot and they point out that that's where the Animaniacs live because I'm a huge Animaniacs, Mark, and I really like that joke. And sure, most people didn't get it. We talked about the Ninja Turtles a couple times already. It's almost like we're setting up for something in the future. Brian, we see the Ninja Turtles get pushed away from the mutagen, but we don't see them get pushed back. Are the Ninja Turtles wiped from this timeline? Uh, wow. Now that you mention it, I don't remember them pushing them back in. Maybe that's a something they forgot or a deleted scene. But in the context of continuity, yeah, the Ninja Turtles got wiped away from, I guess, uh, Warner Brothers history. Even though Warner Brothers owns New Line, so that makes sense. So yeah, I guess. I guess we have no uh, movies to review the next couple weeks. Ah, yes. The Ninja Turtles are actually owned by Nickelodeon now. Oh, but the old movies... The old movies are New Line, which is owned by Warner Brothers. I I have no idea how rights issues like that work. But when we get into the newer movies that came out in 2014 and 2016, those will be Nickelodeon movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to those. But the first one... Oh. All right, let's get to the final burning question. What are your reflections on this summer of Batman? We have reviewed every Batman theatrical release that is not a movie serial from the 1940s, which we will never, ever review. But what are your reflections on this summer of Batman? Um, He's part of the American mythos at this point, it feels like. He feels like, you know, Paul Bunyan, the way Paul Bunyan and all those, like, you know, American urban tales and legends from, like, the 1800s felt like it. These, you know, fictional urban heroes, man, and these, he, everyone knows Batman, and I, every fucking day I see a car with a Batman something or logo or something, man, and it's just, it's worldwide, so to see this journey, it's pretty awesome, and to see, like, movies that are just jokes about Batman, that's even more awesome, we're in a world now where we just get a Joker movie with no Batman, so seeing that, it's perfect, man, and then this was kind of a perfect setup for Joker, too. Because, like, now, after all this, I'm still watching, like, Batman the Animated Series episodes getting ready. And I'm just watching Batman uh, the Brave and the Bold again. Watching all these Joker episodes that are just so crazy and random. But, you know, we'll have opportunities to talk about that probably next year when we talk about other things. But, man, looking back, he's a cultural icon. And we're going to get a fucking Joker movie with Joaquin Phoenix as a potential Oscar winner. That's crazy. Yes, Joaquin Phoenix could very easily be the second person to win an Academy Award for playing the Joker, and that, I think, speaks to uh, the influence of Batman. He is the most influential superhero character uh, that has ever existed, and uh, he undoubtedly has the the best rogues gallery. He is the most interpreted character. We've had so many movies, we've had so many TV shows, and the TV shows, there's just been such a variety. They can be as dark as Batman the Animated Series, they can be as light as Batman the Brave and the Bold, and they can be as as varied as something like The Batman, or even where he's part of the Justice League, for example, or even when Adam West was playing him in the 1960s, and there's still animated movies, and there's going to be another live-action movie, so Batman is still one of the most important superheroes going today. It will be very interesting to see how Batman continues to evolve as years go on, because I think Disney is so ubiquitous at this point that I wonder if the Avengers and those characters have not taken some of the steam out of Batman. But ultimately, I think in in the very near future, I think Batman is going to continue to have such a tremendous cultural impact. And I am very much looking forward to reviewing some of the animated movies at some point in the future as well. But this does end our series on Batman. This is something that we've been doing for the last three months or so, and it has come to an end. 
and we have to move on to something else. And Brian, why don't you tell uh, the listeners what we are going to be moving on to next? Well, we went from uh, Teen Titans Go to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So we're going to go and revisit the movies. I'm really looking forward to the original three Despite how bad 2 and 3 are, uh, I have nostalgia for them. So next week we're going to start with the original, man, 1990. I called it a crime drama. I think it is a crime drama more than it is an action movie. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990, ready to go, man. And uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, It's got, you know, Jim Henson's final touches, because I think he died shortly after this, and he was one of the the ideas for the puppeteering of it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. No CGI turtles, just straight up puppeteering, real drama, real motion. I'm genuinely interested and excited to review the first half and maybe even a little bit of the animated TMNT movie. I have not watched the 2014 and 2016 movies since I originally saw them. I saw the first one in theaters. I saw the second one when I was in China. I'll be very curious to see how they have aged in the last few years because I remember not liking those movies and thinking that the both the look of the Turtles and Megan Fox as April O'Neil were, were complete abominations. Yeah, and I kept thinking to myself at the ending of the first one in 2014 that the last 10 minutes of that movie <clears throat> could probably cost more than the original movie itself. Right, and we'll get into all of that next week as we review the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Thank you, Brian, for joining me this week. And we want to thank all of you for listening to our podcast episode this week as well as all of the Summer of Batman. We will talk to you again next week. So did you hear about Gene Hackman? Like, I heard he's got this really great like real estate deal, something about like earthquake protection. Are you down?